This is part three of Grand Staircase Escalante Partners Trail Ambassador Training Program. This training video will go over all the educational content that is covered within the Trail Ambassador Program. A transcript of this training is available at bit.ly slash trailambassador3. If you have questions about the training itself, contact Caitlin Martin at caitlin at gsenm.org. If you have not watched part one or part two of this training, stop this video and watch those videos first. You can find each of those videos by going to the links on this slide or by searching for them in YouTube. You'll need to fill out the Google form that goes along with this training, which includes questions to test your understanding and your preferences as a volunteer. The Google form is available at bit.ly slash new trail ambassador form. All of this information is available in the YouTube video notes below. All the information in this training program, along with some other details about the Trail Ambassador program, can be found in the Trail Ambassador Handbook, which can be found at bit.ly slash Trail Ambassador Handbook and on our website at gsenm.org slash volunteer. We recommend that all Trail Ambassadors read through this handbook before going out on their first field day as an ambassador. We will also include a copy of the handbook within your field day packet which will include all other Trail Ambassador educational and guide materials. As a reminder, the main goal of the Honoring the Land Trail Ambassador program is to inform visitors of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument of how they can reduce their impact in a friendly and educational manner. This video will go over some of the basic educational principles that we would like ambassadors to discuss with visitors and provides a background on why we think these topics are important. Many organizations use guidelines or frameworks to inform visitors about reducing their impact on the landscape. Grand Staircase Escalante Partners has created an honoring the land ethic that provides reasoning behind why we ask visitors to behave and recreate in a certain way. While we utilize components of existing frameworks, we developed this land ethic to offer a more holistic framing that digs more into the why behind specific behaviors as well as to address specific visitation needs of the unique environment of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument is a living landscape and includes the ancestral lands of numerous native tribes. The Honoring the Land Ethic offers a framework for connecting with and appreciating the monument and other public lands that includes visitation related knowledge and accent actions while also encouraging awareness of both historical and contemporary relations and contexts. This ethic recognizes that respecting and honoring the landscapes protected by GSENM is multi-pronged and includes minimizing impact on the land when visiting, being aware of contemporary native connections as well as the region's history, and helping foster justice, equity, and inclusion in the protection and enjoyment of public lands. These areas of learning and action contribute, contribute to honoring the past and safeguarding the future of GSENM. Trail ambassadors target a subset of the ideas encapsulated in our honoring the land ethic. The main goal of the trail ambassador program is to make visitors aware of their impact in a friendly and educational manner and to help them gain the knowledge and skills to reduce those impacts. Trail ambassadors are not expected to go ever, over every detail outlined in the education principles in this training. In fact, dumping huge amounts of information on visitors in a single interaction is rarely pedagogically effective. However, ambassadors should be familiar with the full details of their framework so they can select pieces of information to share with visitors on the topics most relevant to each specific interaction. This training just briefly goes over the principles in an effort to familiarize volunteers with the scope of the Trail Ambassador Program. When in the field, GSEP will provide Trail Ambassadors with more training and detailed and illustrated how-to guides for the topics covered in this training that will offer visual aids for informing visitors. In the slides that follow, we will first discuss the reasons why we want people to minimize their impact followed by the concrete steps and rules of what they can do to reduce their impacts. In your interactions with visitors, strive to provide the why with the what. This approach offers reasoning behind the visitation guidelines 
to motivate people to enact impact minimizing behaviors. For example, it might not be very persuasive to leave a piece of pottery where you find it just because it is the rule. But if you understand this pottery belongs to ancestors of contemporary tribal members and leaving it shows respect, it could help archaeologists more accurately interpret the area and that it is illegal to take pottery, you might be more compelled to leave it. So it is important for trail ambassadors to get across the whys of all the minimizing impact rules when interacting with visitors while sharing specific actions and tools to visit respectfully. The educational principle that we're going to cover is respecting archaeological sites and features. Given the rich cultural history of the region, this is one of the most important principles for trail ambassadors to discuss with visitors. It is imperative to visit these areas with respect because these lands are important to native tribes, the members of whom have spiritual and cultural connections to these areas. Ancestral lands are living landscapes for native communities. Showing respect for archaeological sites honors these connections. Artifacts and their specific locations tell tribes, archaeologists, and other researchers information about those objects and the people who use them. Taking artifacts is also illegal. Petroglyphs and pictographs are important for tribes and are a vital part of the living landscape that is GSENM. Some native people call these features rock writing or storied rock, which highlights the role they play in past and current indigenous cultures. This imagery holds cultural knowledge. Rock imagery is fragile and the oils from hands can damage them. Defacing rock imagery is not only extremely disre disrespectful, it is also illegal. Ar archaeological sites are fragile and an increase in visitation to sites because of access to information about them on the internet has shown to lead to substantial damage and looting. Furthermore, sharing photos of, archaeological, of an archaeological place can create a tone that these places and items are a kind of amusement, recreation, or exploration, which ignores the ways such items and places are understood from indigenous perspectives. For instance, cliff dwellings, pueblos, and other signs of residences are typically under understood to still be the homes of ancestors, not a playground for contemporary visitors. As discussed on the previous slide, all these points are the whys of respecting our archaeological sites and features. On the next slide, we will discuss the ways or the rules that visitors can physically respect archaeological sites and features. Visitors can respect archaeological sites by following these simple guidelines. Leaving what they find, this includes bones, pottery, flakes, historic trash like rusty cans and bottles, projectile points, and any other objects related to past human activity. Not climbing in or on structures like dwellings, not touching storied rock like pictographs and petroglyphs and not adding to these images with graffiti, not eating or camping within the general perimeter of the site, and not letting dogs run free. They are best kept on leash and out of the site area. In general, we recommend that visitors do not post about archaeological sites or features on social media or other online venues. However, if visitors do post or share online, they should never post and share a GPS track or point indicating where the site is located, share photos that have location data, like photos with a phone with location services set to on for photo taking, give a location description like a trail name or recreation area, or share or post photos of the site that gives context in which others can figure out where the site is located. For example, the photo on the left shows a picture that provides context to a site where the photo on the right does not. DTEP will provide trail ambassadors with materials about visit with respect practices and other information about behavior around archaeological sites so that they can become well informed and provide visitors with accurate information. You can find more detailed information in the trail ambassador handbook and at the Visit with Respect website at friendsofseniormesa.org slash visitwithrespect. Another trail ambassador educational principle is respecting ecosystem health and resilience. Visitors can do this in several ways, including planning ahead and being prepared, traveling on established and or durable surfaces, disposing of waste properly, minimizing fire impacts, 
and respecting wildlife. Before coming to the monument, visitors should plan ahead and be prepared. If visitors take time to prepare for a trip to the monument, they are less likely to get hurt, more likely to follow area regulations, and more likely to be self-sufficient, all of which help cause less impact on the spaces they are visiting. The following points are facets of planning ahead and being prepared. As a trail ambassador, you can help visitors learn about what it means to be prepared, as well as support them in preparing for their current trip, or in a sense, helping mitigate chances of something going wrong by helping provide some of the information they should have. Visitors should know where they are going and have a map of the area. They should also have a general sense of the landscape and environment conditions. Have sufficient food, water, and supplies for their trip. What is sufficient depends on the season or forecasted conditions, and visitors should plan accordingly. They should consider bringing extra supplies in case of unexpected weather, delays, etc. Be aware of any regulations and permits, and be aware of the weather forecast and know the dangers that come with extreme weather in the desert. As a trail ambassador, some of these points may be information you can provide. For instance, you can educate visitors about the dangers of extreme weather in the desert and can inform them of existing regulations for a specific area. For other facets of preparation, you can direct them to appropriate resources, such as the office at which they need to secure a permit, where the nearest potable water source is, and so on. We will provide trail ambassadors with detailed area guides for each area they might be stationed that will list all the regulations, maps, hiking information, potential dangers, and other important area information. Trail ambassadors should also convey to visitors that it is important to travel and camp on durable surfaces. The amazing geology of GSENM provides habitat structure for a variety of ecosystems. And even though the landscape is dominated by rock, the desert is fragile. Thankfully, the rocks and washes in this landscape, along with designated trails and roads, provides visitors with ways in which they can navigate the desert in a sustainable manner. So why is it important for visitors to minimize their impacts when traveling across GSENM? The desert is alive and not well adapted to high volumes of people traveling across it. For example, while on the monument in lower impact areas, you may notice that the ground is covered in a dark crust. This crust is cal called cryptobiotic soil crust, which is created by microscopic organisms such as algae, cyanobacteria, and fungi. The bacteria within the soil releases a gelatinous material that binds soil particles together in a dense matrix, making a hardened surface layer made up of li living organisms and inorganic soil matter. Cryptobiotic soil crust plays an important role in both preventing erosion and supporting water absorption in a place where water is often scarce. This crust of cryptobiotic soil can be damaged easily by people and pets traveling across it. Once crushed, the crust can take anywhere from a few years to decades to grow back. Until recovery, the soil in the impacted area can be damaged by accelerated erosion and nutrient loss. Desert plants, which are important for erosion control, wildlife habitat, and food, and aesthetics can also be damaged by those not traveling on durable surfaces. When people go off these surfaces, such as designated trails and roads, they often leave tracks which can encourage others to follow their path and create more damage. Visitors can move across desert landscapes with minimal damage while hiking, driving, or biking by staying on designated roads and designated trails. They should not cut switchbacks, zigzags in the trail, and not hike next to the trail, even if it's money. Many of the trails in GSENM are not signed and can be hard to follow. Visitors should make sure that they are prepared for going out onto the monument with a map, GPS, compass, and the knowledge of how to use them so that they can stick to the trail. Traveling on durable surfaces. In the absence of established trails, visitors can stick to traveling across slick rock and in washes as much as possible. These surfaces are durable and will not be degraded by their travel across them. Visitors should do their best to stick to established social, social trails and game trails. 
if a designated trail or durable surface does not exist. Visitors should not cross cryptobiotic soil. Not building rock cairns. Building rock cairns can lead other visitors to travel down an undesignated path, mark protected areas and archaeological sites, and can be an eyesore. Visitors can move across landscapes with minimal damage while camping in front country areas, which are mostly thought of as areas that are accessible by car, by only driving on designated roads to get to campsites and not driving off-road to get to a desirable camping area, and making camp and pitching tents in existing camp areas. Many front country camp areas will be marked by a tent sign, and camp areas should be obviously disturbed by a lack of vegetation and soil crusts. While camping in high-use backcountry areas, which are usually areas that have a designated trail to them, or in a popular backpacking destination, like along the Husqvarna River or Coyote Gulch, visitors should do their best to camp in areas where it's obvious others have camped before, not make camp in areas where cryptobiotic soil is present or where there is a lot of vegetation, if possible, visitors should camp in sandy areas or on top of slick rock, they should have their kitchen in areas where equipment is stashed on rocky or sandy surfaces. Visitors should make sure to keep all tents within the perimeter of the established camped area. And finally, they should do their best to camp at least 200 feet from water and be mindful of washes and flood zones in case of the area flash floods. While in low use backcountry areas, which includes a lot of the monument and is defined by a location that rarely sees other people and does not have obvious campsites, Visitors can minimize their impact by camping in sandy areas or on bedrock. If this is not possible, visitors can, should disperse their tents, avoid creating social trails, and move camp every night. Cooking areas should be on rock, sand, or gravel. Visitors should do their best to camp at least 200 feet from water and be mindful of washes and flood zones in case the area flash floods. As a trail ambassador, you can ask visitors if they are aware of ways they can travel sustainably in GSENM. Some topics you can address with visitors are cryptobiotic soil. Are they aware of what it is, why it's important, and what it looks like, and how it can be damaged? Do they know what sustainable surfaces are? Do they have a map of the hiking trail, and do they know how to travel across the landscape if they lose the trail, or if it becomes hard to follow? Do they plan on camping? Do they know how to identify a good and sustainable camping area? An important guideline in respecting ecosystem health is disposing of waste properly. Many people visit Grand Staircase Esquilani National Monument to heed their call to nature, but sometimes nature calls back. With the lack of facilities within the monument, it's difficult to know what to do with your trash or what to do when you need to use the bathroom. Thankfully, there are several ways visitors can manage their waste in a responsible and sustainable manner. It is important to be responsible with waste disposal to minimize water pollution, transmission of illness, interaction with insects and wildlife, and unpleasant experiences for other visitors. These lands are also very important culturally and spiritually to tribes, and leaving trash and not disposing of waste correctly is disrespectful. It can be daunting for many visitors when they have to go to the bathroom, but there are none in close proximity, which is the case in most of the monument. Visitors can dispose of waste properly by following these easy steps when they need to pee. Visitors should find a tree or a rock to pee behind. If possible, they should pee at least 100 feet away from water sources, like springs, streams, and rivers. If possible, visitors should pee on rocks or soil and not on vegetation. Animals will sometimes strip plants that have urine on them to access salts left behind. Visitors should pack out all toilet paper and menstruation products. They should not leave toilet paper behind. It takes a long time for the toilet paper to degrade in this arid environment and it will often blow away in the wind and become litter on trails and in natural spaces. Some tactics for dealing with used toilet paper and other products is to pack it out using Ziploc bag and be thrown away in a garbage can later when one is available. There are two options when visitors to the monument have to poop and there's not a bathroom nearby. 
Which method they choose is all dependent on how close they are to water, hiking trails, and camp areas. If they cannot get further than 300 feet away from water, including dry washes and ravines, hiking trails, and camping areas, they must pack out waste using a portable human waste containment system. This is the case in all the canyons and in most areas of the monument that people visit. If they can get more than 300 feet from water, it is still best to pack out waste, but they can also dig a cat hole. No matter what method they use, visitors must always pack out toilet paper and other disposable products. If visitors are planning on visiting any of the Escalante Canyons or will be in an area where it is impossible for them to get at least 300 feet away from water, hiking trails, and camp areas, they should carry portable human waste containment systems. Portable human waste containment systems can be purchased from most outdoor gear stores online or from visitor centers. Visitors should carry as many as they think may be needed, which will vary depending on the person. But having one per day when recreating on multi-day multi trips, it's a good place to start. It is better to have too many than to have too little. It's always a good idea to carry one for day trips as well, in case of emergencies. These kits come with a puncture-resistant pack, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, and a powder that helps break down waste and reduce odor. Used bags should be stored at the bottom of a backpack or in an outside pouch away from food and medical supplies. Once back in civilization, visitors can just throw these bags away in a trash can. We will provide volunteers with wag bags, both for personal use and hand out to visitors, and with instructional guides to use as a teaching tool when interacting with visitors on these topics. If visitors can get more than 300 feet away from water, trails, and campsites, waste can be buried in a cat hole. It is important to pick a good cat hole site that is in organic soil, is not in cryptobiotic soil, and is not in alcoves or under rocks. To dig a cat hole, visitors will need a trowel, which can be purchased at outdoor gear stores or online. To use a cat hole, visitors will need to dig down into the soil six to eight inches deep, and then cover it back up once done. Again, toilet paper should be packed out instead of burying it in the cat hole. Additionally, visitors should pack out all trash, regardless of size or composition. Though one might think it's okay to leave food scraps like fruit and vegetables because it will decompose, all food scraps are considered trash. Items like banana peels and orange peels do not readily break down and other food scraps can be harmful for wildlife. Trail ambassadors can also let visitors know that there is no trash services in the monument and that all waste should be packed out in their cars and disposed of at home or in a trash can or dumpster at one of the towns surrounding the monument. Visitors should also pack out pet waste using dog poop bags or another method. Topics that you as a trail ambassador can discuss with visitors to make sure they are prepared to dispose of their waste properly are, do they know about the waste disposal requirements in the area? Do they have a trowel and or portable human waste containment systems to comply with these requirements? Do they know how and when to use a trowel and or portable human waste containment system? Do they have the supplies to pack out trash and toilet paper? We will provide trail ambassadors with supplies to hand out to visitors, such as human waste containment systems, trash bags, dog poop bags, and Ziploc bags for those that are not properly prepared. Trail ambassadors should also inform visitors on how they can minimize campfire impacts. Many people like to have a fire when camping, and while the warmth and aesthetic from a fire can be nice when staying in Grand Staircase Escalade National Monument, campfires can be fairly damaging to the landscape. Mismanaged fires can cause scorching of topsoil and vegetation, create large amounts of ash, and create a demand for wood where it is often not abundant. There are also several places within the monument that campfires are not allowed. No open fires are allowed in any of the canyons within Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument and all Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. Visitors should always check if there are any seasonal, any seasonal fire regulations or bans in effect as well before their trip. Visitors can view all fire restrictions at utahfireinfo.gov slash fire restrictions. We will provide trail ambassadors with regulation information before heading out for field days.
It's best to not have a campfire in Grand Staircase Esquilani National Monument if it can be avoided. But if visitors do decide to have one in an area that it is allowed, there are a few steps they can take to make it as low impact as possible. First, if visitors know they would like to have a fire, the best thing they can do is to have one at an established campground with a permanent fire ring. As a trail ambassador, you can inform them about campgrounds with established fire rings, like those available at Calf Creek Falls Campground, Deer Keep Creek Campground, commercial campgrounds within the towns that surround the monument, or one of the many campgrounds on the Dixie National Forest. We will provide trail ambassadors with a map of all the established campgrounds to show visitors. Visitors would like to have a fire, but do not want to camp in an established campground. There are a few things that they can do to make their campfire as low impact as possible. To have a low impact fire, visitors should use existing fire rings and not build new ones. Fires should be kept small and contained and never built in alcoves or near rock walls, even if existing rings exist. If a fire ring does not currently exist, visitors should strongly consider not building one. If they must have a fire, they should consider using a fire pan, which is a metal pan that is designed to hold a campfire. Visitors can purchase fire pans from outdoor gear stores or online. If visitors decide to build a fire ring and do not have a fire pan or access to a pre-existing ring, they should do so in a dry, sandy wash. Visitors should make sure to scatter the cold ashes within the wash or pack them out. Additionally, a campfire wood should be brought from home or purchased from a town near the monument. Visitors should not collect firewood in the monument. If they do have to collect firewood, they should only collect pieces that are smaller than an adult wrist and are dead and scattered on the ground. Visitors should not break off branches from trees that are dead or alive. Large dead junipers play an important role in ecosystem structure and the desert aesthetic, but they are starting to disappear due to firewood collection. In the backcountry, visitors should collect wood throughout the day so that they do not deplete the wood around their campsite. As a trail ambassador, you can ask visitors if they are prepared to have a campfire in Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. You can talk with visitors about minimizing their campfire impacts by informing visitors of the areas of the monument where fires are not allowed and of any current fire regulations or bans. Having a conversation with them about the need for a campfire. Something that you can bring up to dissuade campfire use is that GSENM has known the darkest skies in the lower 48, and even the light from a campfire can obstruct the view of the brilliant night sky. Talking to visitors about where they plan on camping and helping direct them to campgrounds with established fire rings. And also talking to visitors about their fire plan. Some important aspects of a fire plan is knowing the information about the following. Like, are they dispersed camping? Are they camping in the backcountry? Do they plan on using existing fire rings? Or do they have a fire pan? And do they have their own wood? Where do they plan on getting firewood? We will provide trail ambassadors with teaching tools to help you inform visitors about fire impact minimization topics. Another way visitors can respect ecosystems and minimize their impact is by respecting wildlife. From desert bighorn sheep and mountain lions to lizards and kangaroo rats, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument has a large variety of wildlife. When visiting the monument, it is important to respect desert wildlife because they're an essential part of desert ecosystems and landscapes. Different animals have different responses to the presence of humans. Many animals like bighorns, bears, and mountain lions will actively avoid human contact while rodents and certain birds may get close to get a bite to eat or add something shiny to their nests. It is important when visiting Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument to be aware of the impact visitors may have on desert wildlife and to minimize disturbing wildlife and their habitats. Interacting with wildlife can hurt them, affect the ecosystems that they are a part of, and even cause damage to those individuals interacting with wildlife. Visitors can respect desert wildlife by not feeding wildlife. Whether purposeful feeding or not, the consumption of human food can be detrimental to the livelihood of desert animals. Food in this case includes human and pet food, trash, and scented or flavor flavored toiletries. To keep wildlife out of food supplies, visitors should make sure to always keep a clean camp by packing out all trash and food scraps and storing it in a secure location. In their front country, this may include a vehicle or animal-proof cooler. In the backcountry, food should be hanged if possible, 
and are stored in an ammo resistant container or sack, which can be purchased online or an outdoor gear store. Observing animals from a distance. Visitors should do their best to watch animals from an appropriate distance that does not startle the wildlife or force them to flee. Visitors should treat animals with the utmost respect and should not follow, approach, touch, or handle them. If visitors are in the path of a wild animal, they should get out of the way and allow it to pass. Visitors should not block sources of water or harass animals out of hiding places, especially during the heat of the day. Additionally, respecting wildlife means following other impact minimizing behaviors to help protect these animals' habitats. This means traveling on durable surfaces, not picking plants, packing out trash and disposing of other waste properly, and so on. An important piece of, is, of this is that everyone needs water. Consider how each of your actions could affect water sources and avoid damaging them. For instance, if a water source is merely a pool and is not moving, avoid dipping a bandana or other clothes in the water, as that can leave harmful detergents with no dilution and dis dissipation. As a trail ambassador, you can discuss ways in which to respect wildlife with visitors by asking them a few questions about their trip to the monument. Talk to visitors about any wildlife they're excited to see while visiting GSENM. Make them aware that it is illegal and a safety concern for the wildlife and themselves to feed or approach wildlife. Ask them if they have a way to pack out and store their food and trash. Make them aware of the impact they have on wildlife habitat and give them some tools to reduce their impact, like staying on trail, leashing their pets, and leaving what they find, like plants and rocks, which may be an important aspect of wildlife habitat. As with the other topics discussed in this training, we will provide trail ambassadors with teaching tools to get this information across to visitors. As a reminder, all the educational content covered in this training is for familiarization purposes only. All of this information will be available to you as a trail ambassador and does not need to be memorized. If you would like to learn more about impact minimizing behavior, consult the Trail Ambassador Handbook, which is available through the link in the YouTube notes, or at bit.ly slash Trail Ambassador Handbook, or on the Grand Staircase Escalade Partners website. You can also learn more about these topics at the Leaf No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics website at lnt.org. Thank you for volunteering as a Trail Ambassador and for watching this training video. Please fill out the questions for video 3 in the Google form and move on to video 4 about some tactics when talking with strangers on the trail.